Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the Center on Global Transformation and uh, yet another wonderful event uh, from our School of Global Policy and Strategy. I'm Ulrike Schede and I'm a professor of Japanese business and the executive director uh, of CGT, the Center on Global Transformation. Uh, today it is my great pleasure to introduce Gregory Lee to you and I'll keep it very short because Gregory had great, has great uh, things to say. So let me just uh, set this up in a staccato way, if I may. Uh, Gregory is a UC San Diego alumni, alum. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Gregory uh, is, a, is a UC San Diego alum in biological sciences uh, in 1980, may I say it? Uh, 86. Yes, you can go backwards anyways because I'm going to tell you what, what wonderful things he's done since. Uh, he has a great story about what you do when you graduate with a degree in biological sciences and your professor tells you that you're unlikely to win the Nobel Prize after all. Uh, he doesn't strike me as a bench guy anyway, so you'll, you'll see in a moment. Uh, so Gregory then, um, oh and by the way, if I could just interrupt myself at a little time out, there's another event with Gregory next week, Thursday, from 11 to 12.30, it is meant for the students. And so if you are uh, faculty or students, tell other students, uh, the talk next Thursday will be at 11 at GPS on how to think about career planning and how to become famous like Gregory. That's my title, not his. So uh, what did he do after uh, graduating from UC San Diego? He started working for Kellogg, Procter & Gamble, and J&J &J for a total of together uh, 12 years uh, in positions that involved uh, running the marketing operations, not only in the US, but in Hong Kong and Singapore. So he's a global uh, business leader. After J&J, &J, he switched careers ever so slightly and went from medical to consumer electronics and started working for Samsung North America. He spent 13 years with Samsung and up, up, up all through the various positions uh, until he finally just took over uh, Samsung Electronics North America uh, and the consumer uh, market operations there. Uh, when I met Gregory a year ago, he was in that position and so what that means just so to kind of drive that home is that if you have a Samsung TV in your house or a Samsung cell phone in your pocket, uh, Gregory sold you that thing. Right. Um, so I met Gregory, oh, UCSD alum, that's great, why don't you come uh, and, and become a Pacific Leadership Fellow in our Center on Global T uh, Transformation. And Gregory said, that's a great idea. When I was back in touch with him, he said, oh, by the way, I left Samsung. Interesting question. So, what do you do if you were, if you're a consumer uh, and market uh, executive, and you were just in charge of the largest consumer market in the world, uh, for the largest consumer electronics company in the world? Where do you go? And it turns out, Gregory uh, just has the best job in the world. He moved on to Nokia Technologies. Now, Nokia, you will uh, recall, is a, a fabulous brand in search of a product. And Gregory's new task is to find the new Nokia product. Nokia Technologies is a subsidiary of Nokia. It is in charge of IoT and Wi-Fi installations and everything that we need for the digital disruption. And uh, also is branching out into medical devices. And this is why Gregory is here and what he will talk about today. Namely, how do we want to think about the future of medicine? Gregory, it's uh, such a pleasure to have you with us uh, uh, these days, and uh, thank you for everything you've done so far and what you'll do for us, uh, especially in the next half hour. Thank you. Thank you, Ulrike, for such a great introduction. Wow. By the way, I, uh, I was telling people that usually, even within my own company, even when I pay people, I don't get this kind of crowd, so thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, it just seemed like yesterday I was an undergraduate here. 1986 obviously is a long time ago. I was only 10 years old at the time, as you can imagine. I, uh, I, I rode the skateboard because there, all these buildings didn't exist back then. 
from all the way from Warren College to Ravel College, back and forth. And I'm a you know great skateboarder. And uh, when my kids see me skateboard, they're always surprised how their old dad can skateboard so well. Because <laughs> one of the things that I, I've learned here. Uh, Ulrika, Ulrike explained my uh, corporate career very well. I want to say a few things about what a corporate career can be, even though when I was an undergrad here, I thought it would be the boringest thing in the world, and you really have to be dumb and can't do sciences to go into business and uh, be in a corporate life. But uh, I have found that in my case quite different. Uh, you know, I can't speak for everybody here, but you know, many of you may not have had a, a corporate career. But I've had a, a 30 plus year, years of corporate career that was uh, sensational, and I've seen transformation of some of these companies that, you know, with a committed group of people that wanted to change the world in some small way, you know, went from, you know, a third-rate company making third-rate products to becoming one of the best in the world at you know, uh, their companies that are almost going bankrupt and having serious issues to where, as a team of people in the company, you become evangelized, become, go from number four in the world to number one in the world. You go from you know, uh, 50 billion market cap to 350 billion market cap. I mean, you know, there are some phenomenal you know, experiences and stories that I've had during my journey with some of these companies. And so, uh, you know, my perspective, I must say, comes from a lot of those experiences in, in, in the way I'm telling uh, this story. Okay. Uh, okay, let me begin. So, so uh, I have, uh, was in the Johnson & Johnson Medical Division one time. Uh, and then moved over to the consumer division. So I have a, I had a little bit of a view of a uh, medical devices, uh, a view f for a few years, and then uh, in the electronics division, where you know semiconductor uh, products. So products that have just transformed from going from analog products to total digital products. Uh, everything from you know brown tube TVs to you know, analog cameras, you know, all those have transformed into digital devices and they went from film to digital. You know, there was all this transformation and, and uh, analog phones to feature phones to smartphones, you know, all, all, and all these signals and data coming together, you know, was part of sort of my generation. And I think that that install base and the technology that has uh, really kind of embedded into society in established markets here or in emerging markets in places like Kenya, Nairobi, you know, people, 70, 80 percent of people have smartphones. And, and that install base really provides an incredible base for what will happen in everywhere, including healthcare. So I kind of have a lens through, through that. And having seen transformation and seeing old businesses just go, you know, may, may take a little while for it to be disrupted, but when it hits that inflection point, then it's, there's, there's no return. And one number that I really like is that the number of photos taken in the year 2011 equals or slightly surpasses all other photos taken before that. You know, so in one year, you know, people took more photos with their phones, obviously, than all these other photos ever taken in the history of mankind. And, you know, just the access of the digital photos just enable all of that. And I think you're going to see that kind of, that's a good analogy for what can happen, I think, in digital health. Um, however, I, I start with this title that says, in 20 years. Because I think there are reasons why in digital health or healthcare will take much longer than um, just pure electronics that do not have you know, various different challenges, which I'll talk about. OK, so I want to start with sort of future state. The future state is that healthcare will be uh, one of those electronics and tech, tech verticals that will be mobile, ubiquitous, and at home or anywhere. 
similar to and, and leveraging all the platforms that are there, things like security, automation, energy management, entertainment, it will be part of all of that. Uh, you know, natural language uh, in processing. So all of those things will leverage the, the digital health so that you'll be surrounded by devices and services that without you doing, doing anything, will pick up the information, data, and, you know, and merge it with all the other data that's in the system to be able to provide you know, more holistic advice, insights, and share that with your health prof healthcare professional and build a long, rich health record so that we can all live healthier and maybe hopefully forever or for a very long time. So that's sort of the, you know, the, I think the future. And, um, and people are talking about uh, getting there. And I've seen the number like year 2045 is the year which you know, has been out there for a while. Now we're about to pass it. So that's been now, now pushed back to you know, 2050. But at some point, maybe point of singularity, you know, when computational power you know, gets really great, maybe there'll be some breakthroughs that uh, will allow us to live very, very long time or almost live forever. Um, so that's sort of the future state. So that's sort of the wellness uh, experience. But when you look at the sickness experience, when you get sick, what will happen? It, it's, uh, I like to provide an, an analogy like, remember the days when there was a nice little local bookstore that you used to like to go to and then touch the books and touch the newspaper and you know, you just like hanging out there drinking coffee and tea like Barnes and Noble, you know, and it's like your local doctor's office, basically. And they used to say, I remember, that real books will never go away because people really like touching books and reading books and, you know, and touching newspapers and so on. But as you know, well, bookstores have really, um, they've gone out of style. And companies like Amazon has, you know, really uh, become the power. And I think that similar things will happen because uh, there are forces that will create services on your phone where, or your tablets or your TV, whatever that you already have an installed base, the, the, the payers, providers will want you to engage with them using those devices first because it will be cheaper and in many cases the services will be better. And so it, I think it's possible that you will go to your local CVS or Walgreens to take care of simple problems, as evidenced by you know, CVS and Aetna you know, merging together and so forth. But most likely, you'll use devices and, uh, that, and companies that build user experiences that are friendly to you on engaging with it first, so that you don't have to go to your local doctor. And many, I just took my, my daughter to a, a orthopedic doctor to look at her knock knee. It took me, she was a very good doctor, a uh, month and a half. And I really needed to go see her in a week. So, um, and I, because we, I moved from New York and I, I couldn't see my doctor, her doctor in New York. So it would have been much easier if I could have talked to her doctor in New York, just using a phone, using a video service, have her, and, and all she did was, the do doctor, was to write out a short prescription that had two sentences. That's all I needed. It wasn't an emergency. And that's probably, you know, 80% of the kind of care that I need. So um, access via AI, remote consulta consultation, and highly personalized treatments. And um, getting really good quality doctor FaceTime when I need it with the doctor that I want to, to, to manage. Um, today, this is very difficult because you can't practice over state borders. Uh, you, there are so many rules against doctors you know, practicing over uh, a large boundary. And I went to see the CEO of American Well, who's, uh, who's been working on this teledoctor service for his whole, I think, over a dozen years. And he's got some tiny, I, I want to say, uh, 10,000 members and, and he's worked 10 years trying to build 
that service. So it's taken so long because of regulatory issues and other barriers, not technology. His technology, I mean, he's not using any incredible technology. It's just video chatting, you know, uh, but it's taken him that long to provide that kind of service. But in the future, uh, this will happen. And you see some of this happening, and I think one of the most uh, biggest opportunities is the AI-assisted service. And I use this service. I've tried using this service. And um, this company, Babylon, for example, it's a UK company uh, now owned by, uh, invested by Google. And you could just go online, you just turn it on, and it'll say, how can I help you? And you just talk to it and say, I have a little bit of a headache, or I've got uh, a hay fever, I've got allergy, and it tells you what to do. And they're now uh, trialing 50,000 patients in the UK run by the National Health Service. So because, and it's all happening, and I think the biggest force that is going to drive change in this industry is going to be this cost of high, uh, high cost of care in the, in, currently. So um, this is going to happen, I think, uh, rapidly. There are uh, a huge number of companies now doing more machine to machine learning, AI, and these kinds of services. And of course, by the way, uh, this service is a triage where uh, you can eventually talk to a doctor. But they don't want you to talk to a doctor right away. By the way, this, this, this kind of service is uh, being paralleled in many other areas. For example, customer service. If you have a problem with your uh, any device, phone, refrigerator, or anything that's uh, to pick up a phone call by customer service costs anywhere between you know ten dollars to you know fifty dollars, or even your bank. Anytime they answer, so you get all these automated services. Now, you know what happens in, in the customer service, uh, and, and I often go see customer service in, in the large companies that I've worked for. Uh, you know how people work. They work, they sit super close. The customer, you know, they're in places like um, South Carolina, very small towns. They get paid very low wages. They're sitting in cramped quarters. When there's an infection, everybody in the whole group catches it. Uh, it's, it's, like, it's like the American, what do you call it, factory line. And, you know, they can't make any decisions because if it goes over a certain uh, amount of money in terms of cost, they have to turn around and ask their supervisor, hey, is it okay if I say, you know, we can send them a new, new thing or we'll send somebody to fix? So the cost of that customer service is super, super high. Very similar, and it's all being automated. It's, uh, they're using AI to screen uh, escalated calls so that you're trying to manage customers that are really, really angry and lowering those costs. And the same thing is going on here. The cost of talking to you know, a doctor uh, with, without a lot of efficiency is just um, prohibitive. So, so um, you know, you're going to see more and more of this kind of care inevitably. And this is a chart that is, is really shocking. You look at that red spike, that red spike basically is the cost per capita for the U.S. for healthcare. And you see the cost versus the average life expectancy. And the U.S. average life expectancy is, continues to go down due to our public state of health. And the year 2030, thir around 30, Mexico and U.S. will be equal in terms of how long uh, Americans will live. So, I mean, it, the, it's a steady decline of life expectancy and, and steep increase in cost. And those costs have doubled in the last uh, 10 years. So it continues to, to increase. And then you look at what's driving those costs, and you see those red bars, heart disease, lung disease, chronic respiratory, diabetes, and then the super users, people who are acutely sick for a very long time, make up 20% of the cost. And our healthcare system is really designed 
for quick fixes. So if you've got a problem, you go to the hospital, you fix it, you return home. It's not really meant for people to stay at the hospital or, or get very long, long care, intensive care. And the cost of that is enormous. And the challenge with this is that most of these diseases are, or illnesses are uh, lifestyle related. It has to do with exercise and diet, basically. So um, by just doing those things that we can control, the health care cost and the health care um, uh, situation will improve dramatically. And you can see that 80% of the costs, 80% of the $3.3 trillion is really centered around the care of home and hospital versus uh, in the areas of managed care, self-care, consumer, where you can you know, spend the dollars on prevention and uh, early detection and, and the ability to find cure early and to be able to solve the health care problems versus treating the last mile of, I think, illness where people eventually don't make it. So there needs to be a lot more change. So, so, so far I've really talked about sort of the environment that is set up for transformation. You know, what's really driving the need for change, the, the macro aspects of it. And um, let me talk about what I think are the success factors. Number one, uh, incentives and economics really is a key success factor. And I'll talk more about that. And uh, I, I think overall, the big picture is that everybody wants to live longer, live healthier. So th the investment in the space is enormous. And it will continue to, in the long term, it will continue to be. But if you really look at the, the, the range of uh, economics or look deep into that bucket, there are a lot of things that are happening there. Um, it's, it's a very challenging area for a number of reasons uh, that's outlined here, and I'll talk about that. Um, number two, technology. I'm, in technology, I'm talking about things like uh, network technology that enables IoT environments, so 5G, where uh, remote surgeries are possible, where you have very low latency, where you're connected. You can literally do machine you know, movement from far away, so someone can do surgeries from, you know, across the country just by, you know, doing, um, moving their hands. And um, they do that with manufacturing already, so I've seen that, so there's no reason why they can't do that with surgery. But also having a, a connected environment where I showed you your home or your mobile where everything is connected, you don't have to do anything. If you take a pill, it'll already know that you've taken a pill and you're um, insurance company or your doctors will already know. So talking about that whole technology of networks and, and things like sensors and, and so on. I do think that there are some big technology hurdles to be solved. I mean, things like uh, curing cancer and uh, curing uh, AIDS. So some of these big problems is going to require probably quantum leap in, in breakthroughs. So. Uh, some of that will take time. Number three, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of these non-technology issues, the social issues. I think the social issues, things like trust, regulation, and in some cases interoperability where everybody builds their own silo, where that doesn't work with other people's platforms, whether it's data sharing, you know, so Cleveland Clinic data doesn't you know, uh, operate together, interoperate with, uh, um, with Scripps Clinic. Everybody has their own database, and it's locked. So there's not easy way, no easy way to share that data. And the companies are doing the same thing. You know, they want to have their own data and so on. I think people are starting to realize, the companies are starting re to realize that, well, they can't do that with healthcare data. So, you know, those are some big issues. But the next 10 to 20 years, the innovation, if you will, or the burdens of what needs to be solved really kind of reside in those buckets, more than technology buckets, I think. Because 
It'll just take that long to convince people to trust uh, trust companies or trust the, the platforms to uh, share the data or to share data. And especially the, the baby boomers are extremely cautious or uh, spec, uh, uh, are, are um, concerned about their privacy da of data that they will be taken advantage of because the insurance rates will go up, they'll, be, they'll get fa fired at work, or you know, they'll be reorganized, et cetera. And, um, and, reg and regulatory issues, FDA issues, compliance issues, um, some of them have taken very long. I know from personal experience, it is uh, enormous hurdles. Uh, I've had products that have had FDA issues, and we would send them a notice saying that we have, uh, we have a concern about our products, we want to declare it. It would be years before we get an, even an apply, just a reply. Like, we wouldn't even get a reply. So there's very little that you can do um, because they have so many uh, things, in, and, and it's not a priority for them in many cases. That's one issue. Um, there are many treatments that I personally have had that are well-known treatments around the world. Uh, I've had a stem cell surgery done on my knee. Uh, it was a you know arthroscopic surgery. It was proven surgery. Some of the the best doctors in in America have told me to go ahead and do this, but it can't be done in the United States. You got to go out to do it. And that doctor, who is quite famous, he's done thousands of patients, you know, uh, in in Asia, is now doing FDA trials, and he's already done this um, treatment for the last ten years. And he's now going to go through the, the FDA trials for another eight years. So I mean, it's you know those are the kind of problems that need to be solved in order for this to come together. Uh, I put in lead time because I really think that what makes this industry a little bit different, or maybe a lot different, is that uh, it'll take a lot of time to get through these social issues, behavioral issues. Uh, rather than just economics or pure technology. Um, and and um, to, to truly really bring the outcomes that we need to make change in society. OK, I want to talk a little bit about technology advances, breakthroughs that I think are critical. So you see the scale here is on the vertical is impact, and horizontal is complexity. Uh, we're already getting to areas like connectivity where uh, IOT, you know, management, uh, low battery power, uh, IOT environment where everything is going to be connected and so on. And blockchain, we already have some of that technology. It's, it's available. And then migrating up, uh, I believe that we're at uh, version 1, maybe version 1.5 of products, things like wearables, things like um, chipsets and sensors. Um, the wearables, yeah, I have been in the wearables market for a while, are not satisfying customers. Uh, people don't really like wearables. Uh, they get tired of it very, very quickly. And I like to wear all kinds of gadgets and have all kinds of, but I found personally wearables difficult to wear for a long time without getting tired of it. So I, I, know, I know some of you are avid wearable wearers, so uh, you guys are nerdier than I am. But um, you know, the, even the Apple um, Watch or Fitbit, the best-selling ones, are very difficult for people to not get tired of, and especially entering data and keeping track of things where you manually have to do it versus where it's giving you highly accurate information, where your battery life is like 30 days and up, over, and you don't have to do anything, and it automatically sends data. We're not there yet. And, uh, or even you know, put it on your clothes, simpler devices where you don't, you don't even know you're wearing it. That's, I think, a bit uh, away. That's still away. Um, and then the next is really uh, the things that 
are going to surround us everywhere, next generation of, of sensors. And I think the breakthrough will be in more artificial and intelligence-based software that is going to make much more insightful uh, advice to us with all the information that it, it will have. So, you know, those are the kind of things that uh, we're looking for in breakthroughs. And I'll talk about uh, companies that represent some of these technologies. So, I think some of these companies are phenomenal. I get a chance to look at a lot of companies, but uh, some of these are pretty phenomenal. This propeller is a, basically a device company, but uh, it's already uh, shown some results where it's, it's lung disease management, asthma management, so if you use this device, it, it measures air quality very accurately and uh, it predicts when you're gonna have allergy very accurately, so they already have partnerships and paying arrangements with uh, you know, payers because it's been proven to reduce allergy attacks by some over 76%. So pretty amazing, it's tied to you know, your mobile phones and your mobile phone will alert you as to when you're gonna have an allergy attack because uh, of the environmental changes. The Tyco Care are uh, simple devices, not fancy technology. It's all thermometers, it's a, a camera, a blood pressure monitor. It's kind of like the tricorder, but very simple tricorder. It's a device that allows you to take pictures of your throat or your ear or your nose and uh, take measurements at, at home and then send it to your doctor. So s simple thing, but uh, you don't have to go into a doctor's office to do half the things that you already know how to do, and they, they have a, um, a, an instructive way to, to measure your, your d data so that you don't make mistakes measuring it. So it's, it's relatively accurate and it works really well. So simple devices. And the third one, Profusa, it's kind of a breakthrough technology. I think it would be the, the biggest thing for um, diabetes because it's a, a, a four millimeter hydrogel that goes into your skin without piercing your skin. It gets put in so that you don't have to prick your finger uh, two or three times a day. It stays in there for 18 months, no battery. It's already being used for uh, detecting oxygen levels in your blood in surgeries. So uh, this one hasn't been approved yet, but it's approved for other uses, so it's being worked on. I think that this would be a billion dollar company if you know, it can break through. Obviously, you know, um, we all know uh, someone with diabetes and just having to prick yourself a couple times a day is just an enormous, enormous pain. And, and it's just all you know, automated. It's got a fl fluorescent light that detects it and it puts all the data into your uh, phone and it will send it to your doctor and so on. So the next set of uh, companies that I think um, are breakthrough companies have something to do with AI. And you can see that this uh, you know, AI and software-based, insight-based products are going to really make a major contribution to the, to the breakthrough of, of digital health. And here are some examples. Arteris is a you know, AI-based medical imaging analysis uh, an analysis product. It's basically, it's a company that was created by uh, cardiac surgeons that basically um, use AI to detect the volume of blood changes in your ventricles. And by automatically the software studying the other heart cases or patient cases, over 10,000, it's been highly accurate in predicting cases in real patients. So, you know, they're already uh, in the market, they're already starting to, to use the services and, um, and shows a lot of promise. So it basically, you know, is already uh, taking place of what a, a heart surgeon would do in their analysis. So it's highly analytical. Um, it takes only 15 seconds versus a, a human doing it for 30 minutes to an hour. So super quick. I talked to you about Babylon, and, um, and of course, uh, I didn't want to leave out the genomics platform. I'm kind of 
you know, mixed about the genomics platform personally because I've done all these tests myself, like 23andMe and, you know, Helix and so on. And, and it was, for me, more of an entertainment. I hope there's nobody here from those companies. Uh, more for like an inter entertainment kind of, you know, benefit than it was a true health benefit because I didn't really get, you know, what I could do differently to improve my condition or, you know, insight about my health. Um, Helix has services like it, it can tell you uh, what kind of diet you should have. So I'm still working on that, whether that's going to be helpful or not. You know, despite the fact that I know I should have a certain kind of diet, for me to move there is very difficult. I mean, you know, some of these problems that we have about things like diet are not going to be solved just because somebody tell, tells me to, uh, you know, I should eat less and run more. I mean, that's. You know, it's not going to be um, that revolutionary to me. So, so far it hasn't been, but it also tells you, I think it's able to tell you things like uh, whether you should be um, doing more power sports versus endurance sports. You know, it tells you some of these kinds of things through partnerships with other companies. So it's, it's interesting, but I think that the genomics information together with all other information, phenotypic information, you know, um, your sensor information, when you have enough data, I think you bring it all together and then we're, if we're able to bring enough computational power to provide insights, there may be some major break breakthroughs. Of course, we're starting to see some small ways to use it, but um, I, I think that there is a promise, there, there's promise there in, in having that kind of uh, rich information. I uh, want to talk a little bit about healthcare ecosystem and how we can all work together. I think a big part of the problem is that, you know, in healthcare we're so siloed and we're not sharing enough data, we're not able to have holistic view of problem solving and that, um, and that having more data work together will help us make bring drugs to market faster in the case of Wright. So Flatiron is a, a cancer data analytics company that was, you know, bought by Roche in five years for $1.9 billion. And uh, it's really going to help them in the area of cancer drugs and maybe bringing cancer drugs to market faster because they have better data, more accurate data, and, you know, precise data and are able to bring it together faster, et cetera you know, brings a promise of making better decisions because of richer data and better data analytics. So, you know, that's a perfect example. Uh, research Kit and Research Stack. Research Kit is the Apple Research Kit. You know, you already have it in your iPhone. So if you're a researcher, you want to do clinical research, it allows all the end-to-end, -end, from front-end to back-end, all those services to be pr provided, makes it easy. So Apple is going to... Um, I think not only do research kit, I believe that they'll do more and more of these kinds of platform plays to provide uh, an ecosystem for the, or iOS to become an ecosystem for healthcare. And research stack is the Android counterpart. And, and then there's all these longitudinal uh, data sets that are, that's going on, a project baseline, which is a 10,000 people, four year study uh, sponsored by Google and trying to bring all types of data together so that they can uh, determine or find insights to healthcare issues. So, and more and more of these kinds of, um, of data gathering efforts are being made where they become sort of a, a data source, but they're bringing their data and asking others to bring their data to bring data together so that there's a robust information that can help um, improve healthcare. So a lot of opportunity to share data, share information, and become part of the ecosystem. Uh, I want to talk about Amazon, Google, Apple, Microsoft, these kinds of companies. I'm very familiar with these kind of companies. I believe that in the end, they will become big players in this space. It's inevitable that they will because of the skills they have, the cash they have, the brand they have, and the distribution power they have, and so on. So um, 
you know, some of them may not look like they're doing much now, but I think it's inevitable that they'll become a, a, a big pillars in this field. So, for example, Amazon, Amazon have had very little acquisitions in the space outside of Grail, but they have things like AWS, which is you know the the biggest cloud platform, and they have Alexa, which is now probably the the the, the leading market home. Um, interface for people, and then, as many of you know, Berkshire Hathaway, J.P. Morgan, Chase, and Amazon have just, you know, formed a, an alliance to provide services for their employees. And there are a lot of employees in these companies, but use that as a um, a platform to offer services outside of their companies. So that's going to be very big. There, so there will be insurance services, financial services, and cloud services that Amazon's going to provide. And we're not really sure exactly what they're going to do, but they're going to, these big players are going to get together and really kind of practice what, what they want to do in, in terms of uh, big products. Uh, Apple, I mean, Apple will provide the, the smartphones, iPads, the tablets, the Macs, as an install base for what they've done over and over again with their content and services. I think that the simplest way to think about it is if you look at iTunes and how they aggregated all this content of music and really put like music business into tr in trouble. And um, of course, they didn't put every business in trouble. I think video service is not the case. But you know, Apple will have, a, I think, a healthcare platform where you'll be able to have your own customized set of apps and services that are catered to you that you can pick, that you use, and that you'll have your playlist of services that you like. And um, you know, they, they already have a home kit. Uh, they have a health kit. They've, they're acquiring companies not to be in those businesses. But they are acquiring these companies to learn from them on uh, how that data, how their data works on sleep, uh, how to aggregate the data, how to create a platform for all these da data sources like sleep, movement, um, you know, sensor measurements, uh, and so on. Of course, they have their Apple Watch and um, all these other sources of data. They're also working with Fire, which is sort of the nonprofit organization platform that allows um, sharing of data. So pipes to share data. And Google is, is doing things that are similar. Um, if I move on to Google, Google has acquired a lot of companies. And of course, they're managing them in a decentralized manner. They're not managing them in a centralized manner. And they don't necessarily have a, a one sort of centralized strategy toward uh, healthcare. But they have a decentralized model. And they have very, um, they've acquired very good companies like DeepMind. You know, you've heard of the Alpha Zero and Alpha Go. You know, these uh, computers that, or software, that in four hours, uh, it's, I think it's 24 hours, that without any human instruction, learn to play a Go, which is you know much more difficult to learn than chess, and then beat the world champion four to one. You know, and then if, so if, if you think about uh, that kind of capability, they, they have the probably the they're in best position to do AI than anybody else. So they have that computational capability. They have the AI capability to be able to, if, you know, if they can do that, then, and, and they're working on general AI versus just you know, vertical AI where they're solving one problem like playing chess. They, they, the AlphaZero is a software that uh, plays multiple games, so they're on their own, without any human instruction, on their own learn you know, multiple games, and they beat the world champions on, in each different game. So, you know, so doctors will have to compete with that kind of AI going forward. So Google has the capacity, I think, and, and the kind of you know, deep pockets to be able to do AI in this space. So um, in, a, in summary, if you look at the skill sets they have and the kind of cash pile they have, it's inevitable that very successful digital health companies, when they become successful, impactful, and build critical mass where they have enough scale, these companies will want to buy them um, as, as long as it can be shared and, and it doesn't have 
uh, you know, antitrust or co competitive issues, they will want to acquire the knowledge. Uh, um, and that's um, going on. So I just want to summarize a little bit and give you uh, a perspective on what kind of factors will accelerate healthcare improvements and what factors will slow it down. And this is a bit of a generalization, so I'll provide some of the subtle uh, points here. I think in general, technology advances will happen fast. Some, um, some scientific problems will take maybe a long time to solve, but we're going to see so many scientific breakthroughs uh, relatively soon and that will make a big difference. And it doesn't, in many of the services, especially to cut cost or to provide more accurate measurements or to transfer data um, and so on, this kind of, these kinds of services and devices will not be a technology issue. So, you know, I think that'll happen. Economic incentives, uh, the biggest driver is going to be cost reduction. You can see the $3.3 trillion being spent uh, and then going to $7 trillion in eight years. So to reduce that spend and to have uh, the society benefit more from you know, prevention, uh, early detection, and being helped at home, and holistic care, and so on, and reducing that acute care for long periods of time, you know, that's a big e economic incentive. And of course, there are entrepreneurs, you know, very smart people around here that are working on biotech that are incentivized to build companies and solve problems and, you know, become uh, rich. And that, that will be incentives. But I do find in this space, having worked for large companies, that it is difficult uh, space to make, to find big companies that make um, larger revenues build larger market shares and larger profit uh, levels. Unless uh, most of the companies are being sold on IP or breakthrough scientific promise that over time doesn't give you billions of dollars of revenue and so on. So when I you know, often look at small companies, um, they have a lot of challenges. Why? Because they have to go through all of those you know, key success factors, including regulatory, you know, including, you know, data, compliance, um, trust issues, and so on. So I, I, I see a lot of challenges and in economic incentives for a lot of companies um, that, uh, you know, I look at. I find it in, in, in the areas of talent, uh, there are so many talented people in this space, and it, it looks like, to me, strong flow, continuous flow of talent and intelligence in this space to create breakthroughs in healthcare. In the areas where it's really decelerating uh, and providing barriers is this lack of common platform, the interoperability, uh, data access issues, everybody building their own silos and, um, and, have, and creating security issues. And I talked about Google, Apple, and uh, Amazon. I mean, there's questions around, you know, would you trust them with your data? That's a big question, right? So uh, not having a national platform or a common platform where we can trust uh, the platform with our information is a big challenge, and it's going to take a while to, to solve. And, and other social issues, behavioral changes, um, I think that in this space, uh, people will take longer to talk to doctors with their apps. You know, not everybody's going to use an AI doctor right away. I think it, it, it may take longer, and, and that threshold may come later. And changes in regulation, I think, will, will take uh, 20 years, 10 to 20 years to solve these problems, and, um, and uh, fear, fear of sharing data. But having said all these challenges, I'm a big believer that uh, we're going to live longer and live healthier. Um, I think in the United States, you saw that the data says that you know, things are getting worse. But I think it's going to be highly polarized. 
And for those people who, so there are those people who um, stay healthy, that eat well, that exercise, that are think, thinking of holistic um, care of their health and thinking about early detection and uh, um, prevention will live you know, a very long time. And my father, he's 86 and he still works every day, nine to five. And I'm always proud when I see him to do, doing that work. And I say to myself, okay, that could be me, you know, and maybe, maybe a little bit longer. So that's the promise, I think, that uh, Digital Health delivers, that we're all going to live longer and healthier. Thank you very much.